Today we will talk about magnetism. We can start with realizing what a magnetism is. How would you describe it if you should answer the question, what is magnetism? Do you basically say that magnetism is a cooperative behavior of magnetic moments contained in the solid? So we understand this in an intuitive way. We will try to precise this term magnetic moment a little bit more today. What do we understand under the term magnetic moment? It is defined as a product of a current when we speak about current loops. So here we have a current running in a loops and encircling certain area. This area is taken as an oriented area uh, using the right hand rule. So you essentially put your fingers in the direction of the rotation of the current and your thumb shows you the orientation. So this way uh, you obtain a variable, a physical quantity, which has a value. The value is once more the product of the current in the area. And it has also a direction. So it's a vector and the direction is given by the direction, the orientation of the area that the current is encircling. This is a microscopic definition or infinitesimal definition. So we actually define this using an infinitesimally small area. See it here. Now, what if we have a macroscopically large area, such as shown in the example on the right-hand side? Well, then we simply sum up over all these elemental uh, circles that we have around so that, that the area is uh, containing this sum is in fact a discrete version of an integral over the whole area so you would then write that the uh, macroscopic magnetic moment is equal to the integral over the area uh, let's call it s uh, the magnetic moment which eventually will be the current uh, over the area, right? So you end up with this summing up the microscopic uh, magnetic moments. Uh, this will now define the macroscopic moment of a loop uh, which encircles a finite size area. This is now the definition with which we will work. It is good to realize that this magnetic moment that we have here, which is sort of a uh, combination of a geometry and an electrodynamics, so the current is moving, has a certain relation to mechanical moments. That is where the name moment comes into the game, why we call it a magnetic moment. And this uh, connection to the mechanical moments is shown by Einstein de Haas effect. What is this effect? Uh, suppose that you have a ferromagnetic rod, as it's shown here. So let's say it's a piece of iron, piece of steel, and you put it on a fiber. So you connect it here with, uh, with uh, a ceiling. Now everything is in uh, equilibrium, nothing moves, everything is still. You put around your magnetic rod, you put a coil. And uh, with this coil, you will start running a current through it. What we know from electrodynamics or uh, magnetodynamics is that this electric current in the coil will generate a magnetic field. The magnetic field will then interact with the ferromagnetic rod. And the interaction will be in such a way that the magnetic rod will start rotating. Actually, it will not start rotating, but it will uh, just turn. By turning, it will cause a torsion in the fiber. So imagine it really as you have a very thick rope and 
you can turn the rope, you can apply a torque to it, but you can't do that to infinity, right? There is an increasing uh, resistance to the torque as you are uh, increasing, enlarging the torsion. And this torsion from the, uh, from the torsion fiber acts against the uh, magnetic field magnetic field interacting with the mag uh, ferromagnetic rod and generated also uh, current loops inside of, uh, of our ferromagnetic rod. These electric loops inside of the ferromagnetic rod generate magnetic moments. And so at the end of the day, we are coming to the equilibrium between the mechanical, law, uh, mechanical moment coming from the torsion fiber and the uh, magnetic moment that we have generated in our ferromagnetic rod. If in our thought experiment, there would be no torsion fiber and the electromagnetic rod can freely levitate inside of the coil, then what would happen is that the ferromagnetic rod would start rotating because of the application of the uh, magnetic field that we have generated by the coil, the current running through the coil. So we have here an experimental setup, which allows to put together the magnetic moment and the mechanical moment. So what uh, we will do now is that we will put this mechanical moment that the torsion fiber experiences, we will put it in connection or we will uh, equalize it with the magnetic moment we have generated in the rod and put there a certain constant of proportionality, which we call a gyromagnetic ratio. <clears throat> Let's now make a one step back and before we start thinking about the whole material the whole magnetic domains and so on let's think about one isolated electron and this one isolated electron uh, we uh, will represent all it actually doesn't need necessarily needs to be a uh, an isolated electron let's suppose we have a certain um, species element atom or an, an, an uh, electron, which has a magnetic moment, right? So we have one object with magnetic moment uh, mu. Now we put this magnetic moment into a magnetic field. What is happening? Well, the magnetic moment interacts with the magnetic field. The interaction is described by uh, an interaction energy it can be shown from Maxwell equations that is equal to the dot product. So we uh, calculate the scalar product of the two vectors. One vector is the vector of the magnetic field and the other vector is the magnetic moment. And obviously, if you think about all possible geometrical relationships between the magnetic field and the magnetic moment, minimum of the energy is obtained for the parallel orientation. So when magnetic field is parallel to the magnetic moment or magnetic moment is parallel to the magnetic field, right? In that case, we get the lowest energy configuration. And so there is a natural driving force for the magnetic moment to be oriented into the magnetic field, right? This is how you can, uh, how you can uh, simply Think about steering the magnetic moment by turning the magnetic field. Now, this is how it would work if there is no uh, if there is no orbital moment connected with the magnetic field, and we have just uh, with the magnetic moment. We have shown that this is indeed the case. There is a certain uh, uh, certain moment connected with it. So the torque that this magnetic moment will experience, again from uh, pure uh, Maxwell equations, can be expressed using the formula we have here. 
now it is the cross product or the vector product between the magnetic um, uh, magnetic moment and the magnetic field, right? So once again, this is the torque, this is the force that sort of acts on the magnetic moment. It will try to turn it into the magnetic field uh, direction, and that is minimizing the total energy. Good. Now we know that there is this uh, mechanical moment connected with the magnetic moment as well. So what we know from mechanics, you probably know it much better than I do from the mechanics courses. Well, when you have a torque acting, the torque uh, causes a time change of the magnetic moment. This is the angular uh, version of Newton's equation of motion, the second equation of motion, right? When you say that the uh, time derivative of momentum is the force. So when we now put this together, so the equation from here, when we know what is the torque, and we also know from earlier before that the uh, moment is related to the magnetic moment. So the orbital moment is related to the uh, orbital moment by uh, the gyroscopic ratio. When we put all these informations together, we arrive at an equation of motion for the magnetic moment. This can be solved. Maybe it uh, already, uh, you, you have seen this during some courses in, in physics. And this will cause that the time evolution of the magnetic moment will be a precession, which means that the vector endpoint of the magnetic moment will rotate around the magnetic field axis or the direction of the magnetic field. Or, and it's positioned, the end positions of this uh, vector will be on a, a circle and the whole magnetic field will, uh, ma magnetic moment will encircle as uh, a shape called cone. Uh, there will be a certain period for the rotation. So this uh, rotation is not random, but also the velocity, the angular velocity, with which the magnetic moment precesses around the magnetic uh, axis direction. And the frequency with, the, with which the magnetic moment rotates around the magnetic axis uh, is given by so-called Larmor precession frequency. Okay. Let us now uh, really make the one step back and uh, let's try to associate the magnetic moment of a single orbiting electron. So uh, we have this picture that electron in an isolated atom can be seen in the planetary model that an electron encircles the positively charged core. Uh, the attractive force between the positively charged core and the negatively charged electron is compensated uh, by, the, uh, uh, by, by the force uh, connected with the rotation of this electron, right? So the Paulson force. So now let us try to uh, look at the magnetic moment connected with this motion. We have an electron which encircles proton, that means uh, we can see it as a current, as a current where we have the total charge transferred over time, right? So the E here is not uh, the, uh, the basis of natural logarithm, but this is really a charge of one electron that we have here. And T is the period which or the time that an electron needs to encircle this whole, uh, to, to make one rotation around the proton. We will not use anything more at this point than classical mechanics. And we now relate the 
period, so the time that an electron needs for rotating around the proton with its velocity and the radius of the orbit. So 2 pi r is simply the circumference of the orbit and v is the velocity. All right, we have now the, uh, uh, the, the period, we have the charge. So we have in principle, the whole current that uh, this one electron represents. Now we look at it also from the mechanics point of view where the electron has a certain momentum related to its velocity. So when it has a velocity V, then a momentum is equal to M times V. M is the mass of an electron, V is its velocity. And um, the angular momentum of such motion, L, is simply, in this case, equal R dot P, because the momentum in the direction of velocity and is therefore perpendicular to the uh, connection between the circle of the rotation and the position, right? So we end up with uh, R, M, V, uh, where R is the radius, M is the mass of an electron and V is its velocity. And we will now recall the definition between uh, the angular momentum and the magnetic momentum. Angular momentum was gyroscopic ratio times the angular momentum. Angular momentum we know is M R E and the magnetic momentum, magnetic moment, sorry, is area, which is uh, I R squared times the current and the current is E over the period, which is two pi r and velocity on top, right? And we are having the, or we are missing the minus here. And so when we now look at this first part and the last part, we put everything together, we finally can come to an expression for the gyroscopic ratio. So the gyroscopic ratio, as we see here, is given by basic physics constants by the charge of an electron and the mass of an electron, right? So this is uh, a constant similar to, let's say, Planck's constant or uh, Boltzmann constant, expressed simply in the very basic physics constants. And uh, finally, we now uh, make use of, again, or I will refer you to your knowledge, the basic knowledge of the quantum mechanics, in which you know that the angular momentum is a quantized quantity. And so it can have only discrete values in terms of the reduced Planck's constant. Therefore, if we again say that the magnetic momentum is uh, given by the gyroscopic ratio times the angular momentum, we say that the angular momentum is uh, quantized and it can take only uh, discrete multiples of the Planck's reduced constant. So the smallest possible value is then gyroscopic ratio gamma times the reduced constant, Planck's constant. And this is what we will from now on call the Bohr magnetron. So this is the uh, smallest possible magnetic moment or unit of magnetic moment will be the a unit for quantization of magnetic moments. Speaking about the quantization, Again, you know from even high school chemistry that we use uh, four quantum numbers to describe the state of electrons, apart from the principal quantum number, which uh, labels the individual orbitals or individual uh, types of or uh, orbitals. We also use the uh, 
orbital quantum number, which then is related to the uh, corresponding angular momentum. Okay, so if we would recall again that uh, there is a certain relationship between the magnetic moment and the angular momentum, the angular momentum is uh, connected with the electron rotating uh, or, or uh, orbiting around the atomic proton or atomic core. Uh, therefore, it has a certain mechanical angular momentum. The operator of angular momentum uh, has discrete values of its uh, uh, that, that, that can take. These discrete values are L times L plus one square root of that times H bar. So these are the discrete mom uh, the discrete values of the uh, magnetic momentum, uh, sorry, of the angular momentum. And uh, therefore the magnetic momentum, moment uh, related to the angular momentum takes discrete values, which are multiples of the angular momentum and using the gyroscopic ratio uh, and the Planck's constant together, we again arrive here at or magnetron and then the square root of L times L plus one. So the fact that we have here, this expression comes again, or I would refer you to the basic quantum mechanics course where the quantization of angular momentum should have been discussed. The next magnetic, uh, the, the next quantum number that we are using the so-called magnetic quantum number, uh, which says that for each of these uh, magnetic moments, so we have a certain value of the magnetic moment, uh, it cannot be arranged in the space randomly, but when we choose a certain axis, and typically this is the z-axis or the axis of your magnetic uh, uh, field applied, then the uh, components of the magnetic moment projected into this special direction are also only discrete values. And the discrete values are then a multiples of the Bohr magnetron once again, and the multiple, the integer number that says uh, how many times or how, how, uh, how large is this uh, component of the magnetic moment are called the magnetic quantum numbers. And the last number that we have is the so-called spin quantum number. Uh, the spin quantum number was traditionally then um, imagined as a rotation of an electron around its own axis. So again, referring to astronomy, to something macroscopic that we can much easier imagine, uh, the Angular momentum refers to the rotation of an Earth around the sun. And the spin quantum number, spin itself, refers to the rotation of, an, uh, of Earth around its own axis. Uh, nevertheless, with the coming of really wave quantum mechanics, it is difficult to imagine what such uh, as spinning around its own axis would be in terms of the wave function. And so maybe for us, for the time being, the best is to um, sort of accept that each electron, each fermion can have only two values. We typically uh, call it a half plus, uh, so, sorry, uh, one, one half or minus one half, or we can actually then uh, uh, say that the spin magnetic moment so the uh, really spin of one electron is the Bohr magnetron times this number, this half spin, one or minus one half. And this is what we will work with from now on again. So the same as an Earth around the sun, which has in fact two uh, or its total spin, or angular momentum is a sum of the uh, 
uh, angular momentum coming from the rotation around the sun plus the rotation around its own axis, we also define the total angular momentum of an electron, which is related to the angular momentum and therefore uh, to the uh, to the angular momentum uh, and to the um, angular quantum number and to the spin or angular momentum related to the spin quantum number. The bold symbols here, they represented all of these momenta are vectorial properties. And the sum here is uh, nothing else than a simple vectorial sum. Let us now try to have a look at what happens when spins interact. Okay. Uh, we will describe this interaction with so-called Heisenberg Hamiltonian, an interaction Hamiltonian. The quantity J corresponds to the strength of this interaction. Apparently, if J is equal to zero, Hamiltonian is equal to zero, and uh, there is no interaction, the larger is J, the larger is the interaction, or the stronger is the interaction. Now, if I have two spins, I call, I, I define their dot product, uh, which of course is equal to one if they are parallel and is equal to minus one if they are anti-parallel and is equal to zero if they are perpendicular to each other. All right, so this is nothing else than a normal uh, uh, scalar product of two vectors. So now, depending on the actually absolute value of J, whether it's plus or minus value, we will either prefer uh, we will either prefer the orientation of spins parallel or anti-parallel. If J is negative, then we can minimize the energy by putting these spins parallel, by which if they are parallel, the SA dot SB is maximized, and therefore times negative number, we get the lowest possible configuration. If J is positive, we will prefer to have anti-parallel arrangement of the spins. Now let's assume that all of these are simple, uh, electrons. So we have one half spin particles. That means the absolute value of SA and SB is equal to one half. That means our total magnetic moment of the whole system is equal to either zero or one, depending whether SA and SB have the same uh, same value uh, or the same orientation or opposite orientation. We can also estimate what is the uh, absolute value of the magnetic, uh, the, the spin squared, the total spin squared. How do we do that? Well, we actually realize that SA squared and SB squared are identical and both of them have value three quarters. Why? Well, because SA is, so SAX, the projection of the, the, the spin A into the X axis is either one half or minus one half, right? Again, we can choose the projection into whatever axis we want the probability that it gets in uh, that, that that it gets projected into one half or minus one half is the same. The value is the same, and therefore this uh, squared value would end up with one quarter. Now, the axis into which we project the spin, we say that our particles are one half spin particles, can be any axis. So, in principle, the projection into any of these axes should end up with the same value, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, right? So uh, on in, in total, this SA squared would end up with three 
quarters. The same thing for the SB value. And so what do we have now? S dot squared is either zero or one. One squared is one. And so from here and here and here, where this is equal to SB as well as squared, we can now obtain what are the admissible values of SA dot SB. And the two cases are uh, for total spin equal to zero or one. We get that the interaction, overall interaction, is either minus three quarters of J, the interaction energy, or one quarter of J, right? Again, depending whether these spins are antiparallel or parallel. And that means that we had two identical spins we started with. We had two electrons with identical energy. So uh, our total energy would be actually energy H tot is Hamiltonian of the first spin plus Hamiltonian of the second spin. These are uh, each of them individual and non-interacting plus this H int which is the interaction Hamiltonian that we have here, all right? So the two spins are identical. That means this and this gives you the same eigenvalues, the same energy values. And depending on their arrangement, the energy levels will be further split into, uh, depending on their orientation, either by minus three quarters of J up or one quarter of J down, depending again on the value of J. This further splitting of the spins in the presence of the magnetic field, which then orients the uh, spins into the, uh, into the axis of the spin and the interaction starts working, is called, um, is, is called the, the splitting of the energies that we have here. When we add an external magnetic field, the energy levels will be further split and this is called Seaman effect. That is beyond what we want to discuss here, all right? So we have now, we have here actually discussed this first uh, level of splitting where from one energy level, we now come to two uh, different energies depending on the arrangement of the spins. This splitting happens without the presence of an external magnetic field happens because of the interaction of the two spins. Further on, with the presence of magnetic field, these energy levels will be further split and we will get a so-called hyperfine structure, energy structure of an atom. Okay. Good. So let us now come to a bit more macroscopic description of magnetic properties. We will talk about magnetic flux and uh, magnetic field strength. So the properties, the quantities, you know, again, from Maxwell equations as B and H. Um, in under normal conditions, these are two parallel vectors which are uh, proportional to each other and the a coefficient of proportionality is the permeability. Uh, this is, for example, the case in vacuum. Now, if we are in material, the external magnetic field, B, induces a certain magnetization in the material. And then the, uh, the total magnetic field is not only the magnetic flux, which is related to the strength, so really the external magnetic field itself, but inside of the material, it is enhanced or maybe decreased by the generated magnetic uh, field by arranging the uh, magnetic moments of the electrons, right? So the magnetic uh, moments, if they arrange themselves, they generate additional magnetic field which they'll 
internally counteracts the external magnetic field. This is called the magnetization. The magnetization can be again expressed as a certain fraction proportional to the, uh, to the magnetic field strength H, which will then allow us at the end of the day to again speak about the magnetic flux being proportional. Uh, so here we would have probably one plus uh, chi zero to the magnetic strength H, right? Um, this part, the magnetic susceptibility is then uh, the, and I have probably not expressed that correctly. Uh, there is, uh, there would be what we would have to have here, uh, something else, right? So, excuse me, to make everything work perfectly, we need to have here the uh, permeability again, and then we need one plus uh, chi over mu uh, of h. Right, this is now correct. So the first term corresponds to the uh, magnetic strength itself, whereas the second term corresponds. Uh, the second term corresponds to the uh, generated magnetization. Um, in general, the susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility, is a tensor. Tensor means that there is a linear proportion between the magnetization and the magnetic field. That is true, but not necessarily in that sense that the magnetization must be parallel with the magnetic field. Right? It might be that the generated magnetization has a certain geometrical relationship with the magnetic field. They are not necessarily parallel. If this is the case, then this uh, number, the magnetic susceptibility, is not a simple scalar quantity, but would be a second order tensor quantity. <clears throat> so what could be the possible uh, relationships of the magnetization of the generated magnetization with the um, outer magnetic field or magnetic strength. They can be either anti-parallel, which means that inside of the material, the magnetization acts against the external magnetic field. And this fact that they are anti-parallel leads to the fact that the susceptibility is a negative number. And such materials are called diamagnetic, where the dia comes from the Greek term for across or against. So in diamagnetic materials, the magnetic field inside is either completely vanished or it's reduced compared to the magnetic field outside. This effect is always present but very often this is a weak interaction, weak kind of an uh, response of a material to the external magnetic field. If the individual magnetic moments of atoms uh, arrange uh, in a manner that enhances the magnetic field, so the magnetization is parallel with the uh, applied magnetic field. We obtain a behavior which is called paramagnetism, paramagnetic material. Again, the para comes from the Greek term for along or with. And we obtain a behavior of the magnetic, mom of the magnetic moments where um, these at low temperatures, the magnetic uh, spins would align themselves into the direction of the magnetic field. What is important to realize here is that the individual magnetic moments are non-zero in uh, all of these considerations. 
or especially in the paramagnetic fields, uh, they can be non-zero or they should be non-zero, even in the case where the magnetic moment, external magnetic, uh, external magnetic field is equal to zero. So we have no external magnetic uh, field. The magnetization at that point is zero, but that does not mean that the individual magnetic moments on atoms are zero, right? They are just disordered. And on average, the whole material does not provide any microscopic magnetization. The moment we apply external magnetic, or, uh, magnetic field, the magnetic moments start arranging themselves into the direction of the magnetic field. And this alignment of the magnetic moments leads to a generation of macroscopic magnetization. We can try to evaluate some cases and see how this actually works for the case of, again, non-interacting uh, spins. So we have now the uh, spins with the total angular momentum equal one half. And we can try to see uh, what, uh, what kind of a arrangement of the spins we get as a function of temperature. The resulting magnetic moment of those spins is plus or minus Bohr magnetron. So they can be either uh, one plus half up or down, which comes actually from this expression. So from the fact that we have the total magnetic moment equal to one half, which is what we assume for this simple example, we obtain discrete values for the magnetic moment, mj, so for this magnetic uh, number, and uh, the total magnetic moment will end up being uh, just four magnetron. The total magnetic energy that we have uh, for each of these spins is, uh, uh, is either plus or minus uh, mu bu times B, where B is the externally applied magnetic field. So essentially no magnetic field, we have no energy. If we apply an, an external magnetic field, then each spin can have either plus or minus energy level corresponding to the uh, Bohr magnetron times the magnetic field. Means each of these spins can be in one or other state described by these energies. And from thermodyna uh, thermodynamics, we can now construct the so-called partition sum, which is uh, the sum over uh, all probabilities of these states where we sum up all the Boltzmann factors corresponding to each individual states. And again, the EI, two states we have here, are the plus and minus energies that we have here. Plugging this, we have just two states, so the sum is actually very trivial, and we end up with the very simple, in this case, expression for the partition sum with the hyperbolic cosine. Once again, I would like to point out that this value is non-zero only for non-zero magnetic field. It can be then shown that the free energy is related to the logarithm of the partition sum. This is nothing else than a weighted sum of energies of individual states. Uh, so if you would actually write it down and you would say that this is, let's say, factor alpha one, and this is factor alpha two, what you would get from the expression that we have here is that uh, the uh, energy is equal to alpha one times energy one plus alpha two times energy two divided by alpha one plus alpha two, right? So the Exactly, these Boltzmann factors are nothing else than thermodynamic weight factors. Um, and together, they provide you the probability that a state with energy E1 or E2 is realized as a function of temperature. You obtain total free energy as a function of temperature and the applied external magnetic field. The number N 
that we have here uh, corresponds to the volumetric density of spin, so how many atoms we have in our system. Good, and we can finally obtain magnetization out of this free energy, so from this thermodynamic treatment. Um, and it can be shown, maybe you did this in thermodynamics, uh, the macroscopic or the thermodynamic relationship between the free energy magnetization and the magnetic field. Magnetization is obtained as a minus partial derivative of the free energy, Helmholtz free energy, with respect to the magnetic field. And we arrive at such dependence of the magnetization of our sample, sample of spins uh, of one half, as a function of uh, the ratio of the applied magnetic field and the KBT. So increasing temperature means T goes to high values, and that means in terms of this factor, we come towards zero. So this direction of the red arrows corresponds to increasing temperature, decreasing temperature to low temperatures means that we go to one or the other direction. Right? If the magnetic field, applied magnetic field B is zero, then independent of the magnetic oh, of the temperature, we get that the magnetization is equal to zero. Right, so that's the two limiting cases we have obtained here. And we can also obtain from here the dependence, uh, the temperature dependence of the uh, magnetic susceptibility, once again, out of its definition, where we have the magnetization as defined as a proportional to the magnetic flux. Uh, from the uh, magnetic flux, we relate it to the external magnetic field, which then uh, cancels out each other and we get that susceptibility is inversely proportional to the temperature. And such a relationship is known as Curie law. Again, maybe you have already seen this in some of the lectures. Here we have now explicitly derived this from our microscopic model of individual spins, spins that interact with each other are uh, via the external magnetic field. Otherwise, there is no interaction between them so far. If we have a uh, spin with a larger value than one half, so the only thing what changes is that the magnetic moment of corresponding to the spin can take more discrete values than just the two that we said before was the minus plus or magnetron, the whole evaluation will yield somewhat more complicated uh, analytical function that cannot be treated analytically anymore. We will search for some numerical solutions. And instead of the hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic cosine that we had there, we will now get a function which is called the brilliant function, which describes the behavior of our system as a function of the magnetic field. So we spoke about interaction of two, uh, of, uh, two spins without the presence of magnetic field. That was the splitting of the energy levels. And we spoke about non-interacting spins in an external magnetic field. There we got the uh, Curie law and the dependence of the susceptibility on the temperature and the magnetization on the temperature and externally applied magnetic field. And now we would try to put everything together where you see that we combine the interaction of individual spins with the magnetic field. So this is what we did on the previous two slides with the interaction Hamiltonian. So here we have the interaction, pairwise interaction between the individual spins, the so-called Heisenberg uh, spin Hamiltonian. 
Well, what we do now is that we rewrite everything together as a sum over individual spins times some effective magnetic field. The effective magnetic field here is seen as the external magnetic field plus the interaction from all other spins. And this effective magnetic field is called molecular field. We uh, essentially sum up the interactions from all other spins. We call this the molecular field, molecular magnetic field. Doing so, we arrive at an expression which formally looks the same as when we had the non-interacting spins, right? We would have here times some magnetic field. I label it tilde prime. This is now equal to the external plus the molecular magnetic field. Right, so that means that we expect our solution in the same form as what we had for the non-interacting spins. And then we just uh, exchange the external magnetic field B with the sum of the external magnetic field and this molecular magnetic field. So let's try to do this. And uh, let's try to have a look at what we get uh, if we try to have um, the interacting spins, okay? We will end up with so-called ferromagnetic order. And uh, we eventually would obtain that there is a non-zero magnetization, even for zero magnetic moment. So this is what we get from the solution, graphical solution or numerical solution of this equation. Again, this equation, the bj here, are the Brillouin functions we have introduced or very briefly mentioned two slides ago for j equal to one half. Those are the hyperbolic cosines that we discussed as well. And here now we have that the magnetization ends, uh, enters both the argument of this function as well as the left-hand side. And therefore there would be non-zero value of magnetization for which this equality can be obtained. Okay. And this is uh, below certain temperature, as it's shown here. So for high temperatures, the only possible solution that we get is that the magnetization is equal to zero. For, low tem for lower temperatures, we get probably just a single small value. And for low temperatures, we get a possibility that the magnetization is equal to zero. That's one possible solution. Or the other possible solution is that actually the magnetization is non-zero, even in the presence of no magnetic field. And uh, this means that we obtain a spontaneous magnetization. Once again, the uh, magnetic spins of individual atoms are spontaneously aligned without the presence of the uh, external magnetic field. This happens below certain critical temperature. This critical temperature is known as a Curie temperature. So what we obtain here is a magnetic transformation from spins being aligned in a parallel manner, at low temperatures, and being disordered, it means they have their individual spins are non-zero, but their sum is equal to zero, total magnetization is equal to zero at high temperatures. The low temperature order is known as the ferromagnetic order when spins are aligned. The high temperature order, this uh, disordered magnetic moments, is often called paramagnetic order, paramagnetic state. But re, uh, sort of uh, differentiate between the paramagnetic state and the paramagnetic interaction, the interaction which is caused by the external magnetic 
field. Even if you have paramagnetic material, that means the magnetization is equal to zero at high temperature. Individual magnetic moments are disordered. When you apply external magnetic field, these disordered magnetic moments at high temperature will start aligning. Whether they align fully or not, that's a matter of the temperature, Curie temperature, and what the material can withstand. But they will have a tendency to align into the direction of the magnetic field. <clears throat> and uh, finally, I will very, very briefly mention here another a possible situation where we have two sublattices, each of them behaving like the ferromagnetic case from before and having opposite signs. And we will simplify our life as much as possible. So we will assume that these two sublattices are identical and they are one of them populated with spin up and the other one with spin down at low temperature, so below the Curie temperature, right? So you can imagine it, for example, as uh, having an FCC lattice uh, where all the atoms in nickel, for example, have a low temperature, zero Kelvin, or doesn't have to be zero Kelvin, low temperatures, they are all aligned in the same direction, even when there is no external magnetic field. And now we add another sublattice. So for example, we come from a FCC to a diamond structure. And the other sublattice is populated with atoms that have identical magnetic moments what, when it comes to the length, but they are oppositely oriented. And so we eventually generate on the macroscopic uh, level two magnetic fields, as it's labeled here, B plus and B minus each one of them corresponding to one of those magnetic, uh, uh, to, to one of those sublattices, right? Again, because the two sublattices, the magnetic spins on each of these sublattices are identical, the magnetic, uh, the magnetizations on each of these sublattices are coming from the sublattices are identical when it comes to the absolute number. They are of course opposite. So such material exhibits a macroscopic magnetization equal to zero, but each of the sublattices has a non-zero finite size magnetization at zero Kelvin or low temperatures. So we would once again treat the same solution for each of these sublattices, eventually providing us with equivalence to what we saw on a previous slide for the ferromagnetic material. We saw the transition from the low temperature ferromagnetic order, all spins parallel with, the magnet, uh, with uh, each other, to the high temperature state where they were disordered. In the case of having two sublattices and having the possibility that the magnetic spins are anti parallel ordered, now we say that at low temperature they are all on one sublattice ferromagnetically ordered, the other sublattice is also ferromagnetically ordered, but in the opposite direction, leading to the anti-ferromagnetic state. High temperatures, this order on each sublattice is lost. We obtain a completely disordered state when it comes to the magnetic moments. Again, we arrive to so-called paramagnetic state. And in this case, the transition temperature is called Nail temperature, so not Curie temperature as for ferromag uh, ferromagnetic materials, but in this case, we call it nail temperature. And the final note that I have here is a geometrical picture showing the possible uh, anti ferromagnetic orderings uh, in simple cubic. This is uh, more an academic issue, but for BCC materials, this is really an, an already very relevant for material science. For example, the order that you see here for A lattice, this corresponds to the fer uh, anti-ferromagnetic ground state of chromium, right? So you see it's a BCC lattice with atoms sitting on the cubic 
lattice corners plus one atom in the middle. Now the atoms at the corners have, for example, spin up, you imagine it, and the atom which sits in the middle of the lattice in the center of the cube would have an oppositely oriented spin. So the spins are perfectly aligned. The total magnetization, magneti the, the total sum of the magnetic moments is equal to zero. If we, however, look at one of those sublattices only, for example, the blue one, we get a non-zero magnetization, even at zero Kelvin, and even without any presence of the external magnetic field. Important to realize here is that this order of the magnetic spins is related to the interaction of the spins. If they do not interact, they do not know about each other, and they cannot align themselves. Right? And once again, I recall here what we had a couple of lectures ago, the exchange interaction. There we discussed the interaction between individual electrons, quantum mechanical interaction, which led to the communication between the spins. And at that point, I said, we had no exchange interaction. We had no spin arrangement, no spin ordering, and we would have actually no magnetic orders. We still would have the uh, interaction of the magnetic moments with the external magnetic field. Right? So there would be magnetization induced by the external magnetic Field, but not the spontaneous magnetization we speak about here. We speak about in ferromagnetic or anti 